video in the sign of four today we're going to be looking at chapter 12 the strange story of jonathan small uh, before we do though i'm just going to say that because this is such a long chapter i'm going to split it up into three different videos um, i think this chapter splits nicely into three sections and it will be easy for you to follow and it's going to be a lot easier for me to record um, before we start talking about the chapter let's just quickly recap chapter 11. so in chapter chapter 11 we are presented with Jonathan Small for the first time. We get to see a little bit of what he looks like, a little bit of how he acts. All of this is going to be developed a lot more within this chapter. We also find out that he's thrown the treasure into the Thames. You know, the, the, the jewels and the gold, they're not in the chest. And so Mary Morstan isn't going to get the money. So she's free to pursue a relationship with Watson because they're going to remain on the same class level, you know, if you think back to the things I talked about at the end of the last video. So, in this first section, well, overall, chapter 12, we're going to be given Jonathan Small's confession. We're going to find out everything that happened, we're going to have all of the loose ends of the story tied up, and this book does end with quite a satisfying resolution. But in the section we're going to look at, we're going to see the actual fate of the Agra treasure. We're going to get some idea about why Jonathan Small has thrown this into the Thames. This section really deals with the idea of justice. So if the theme of justice were to come up in your exam, this first section from chapter 12 is a really good part to take quotations from. We're also going to get a little bit of Jonathan Small's history, find out where he came from, how he ended up in India in the first place, and some of the tragic events within Jonathan Small's life that leads to him stealing the treasure. And this section will end with the beginning of the pact that he makes with the other members of the Sign of Four, uh, but we'll save that for the next video. Okay, so as with all videos, remember we've got this breakdown of the chapters. Uh, I've done this here, this is section A. We're going to be focusing on up to section seven here, but I've also got section B here uh, and then when section C arrives, there's a breakdown there as well. Okay, so let's get started. A very patient man was that inspector in the cab, for it was a weary time before I rejoined him. I, I don't know I always do this, but I'm going to do it again. Remember, Watson is at Mary Morstan's house. This chapter starts with him returning to Sherlock Holmes at their house together at Baker Street, where they're going to interrogate Jonathan Small. Okay, I'll try again. A very patient man was that inspector in the cab, for it was a weary time before I rejoined him. His face clouded over when I showed him the empty box. There goes the reward, said he gloomily. Where there is no money, there is no pay. This night's work would have been worth a tenner each to Sam Brown and me if the treasure had been there. Mr Thaddeus Sholto is a rich man, I said. He will see that you are rewarded, treasure or no. The inspector shook his head despondently, however. It's a bad job, he repeated, and so Mr Athony Jones will think. His forecast proved to be correct, for the detective looked blank enough when I got to Baker Street and showed him the empty box. They had only just arrived, Holmes, the prisoner, and he, for they had changed their plans so far as to report themselves at the station upon the way. My companion lounged in his armchair with his usual listless expression, while Small sat stolidly opposite him, with his wooden leg cocked over his sound one. As I exhibited the empty box, he leaned back in his chair and laughed aloud. This is your doing, Small said Athelney Jones angrily. Okay, so we have um, a little bit in this opening that develops attitude towards the police. It's, it's nothing that we haven't really seen before, but, you know, we, let's cover it. So to begin with, in terms of time, it was a weary time before I rejoined him. This means that, you know, the police officer was bored while he waited, which indicates that Watson had spent a lot of time with Mary. You know, maybe there were further details after his uh after mary saying you know we could be together maybe there was more time that watson chose not to include in the in the novel but but you know he spent a lot of time there so his face clouded over so this metaphor shows that the police officer was disappointed by the fact that there wasn't any treasure because he is only after the money and this develops you know Athelney jones talking about it being a bad business or, or sorry a, a pretty business 
you remember we, we looked at in chapter seven i think we looked at that contrasting quotation sherlock holmes saying it was a pretty business where uh, sorry it was a, a pretty demonstration whereas Athelny jones says it was a pretty business showing that the police are really interested in money and making money uh, and that's developed here he complains that he's not going to get any pay however watson trusts in right and wrong and he, he also trusts that rich people will do the right thing he says you know he will see that you're rewarded treasure or no i think that he is sholto so watson a little bit naive there i think i'm not sure that that is sholto is going to give the police any money um however you know the policeman then talks about it being a bad job linking with that idea that it is a business further developing our our understanding of victorian attitude towards the police uh, then we get a, just a little quotation showing holmes again he lounged in his armchair with his usual listless expression this is a quotation um that shows holmes's physical appearance it's something that we've seen through the novel before uh, and then small now here small sat stolidly opposite so stolidly if you do something stolidly then you are calm so even though the treasure is lost and he's had to throw it away even though he's been caught jonathan small is still behaving in that kind of you know it's a fair cop you won i lost you know sportsman like uh disposition which is strange when you think about all the things that jonathan small's gone through and then he's lost the treasure and he knows he's going to go back to prison um his wooden leg was cocked over his sound one uh, that cocked links with the idea of being cocky it shows confidence jonathan small in this moment is very much in control he knows the people around him want his story and so he can kind of behave however he likes because he's going to tell them and they want to hear it so he's very very confident in this this situation oh that's always happens so yes i have put it away where you shall never lay hand upon it he cried exultantly it is my treasure and if i can't have the loot i'll take darn good care that no one else does i tell you that no living man has any right to it unless it is three men who are in the andaman convict barracks and myself i know now that i cannot have the use of it and i know that they cannot i have acted all through for them as much as for myself it's been the sign of four with us always well i know that they would have had me do just what i have done and throw the treasure into the thames rather than let it go to kith or kin of shalter or of morston it was not to make them rich that what we sorry it was not to make them rich that we did for Achmet. you'll find the treasure where the key is and where little tonga is when i saw that your launch must catch us i put the loot away in a safe place there are no rupees for you this journey you are deceiving us small said Athelny jones sternly if you had wished to throw the treasure into the thames it would have been easier for you to have thrown the box and all easier for me to throw and easier for you to recover he answered with a shrewd sidelong look the man that was clever enough to hunt me down is clever enough to pick an iron box from the bottom of a river now that they are scattered over five miles or so it may be a harder job it went to my heart to do it though i was half mad when you came up with us however there's no good grieving over it i've had ups in my life and i've had downs but i've learnt not to cry over spilled milk this is a very serious matter small said the detective if you had helped justice instead of thwarting it in this way you would have had a better chance at your trial okay we'll stop there and we'll go to justice in a moment so so this is kind of um this is jonathan small explaining what's happened and giving some explanation as to why he's done it and as we're going through all of this i want you to think about how was jonathan small presented as honorable how is he shown to have honor for the people that he cares for or, or at least the people that he feels um, he owes something to so he says yes i have put it away uh, which is a euphemism to mean to get rid of something to not be seen again uh and it shows his position of power you know he he uses here i uh, and that is that that he is acting alone in this and that he was the one that can make the decision it also has connotations of it being like a toy that the treasure was was something to be used within the game 
uh, of Holmes trying to catch Jonathan Small. Uh, and then and then more, we get more of these pronouns. My, it is my treasure. Uh, and this is, a, is a, a nice way of putting it. If I can't have the loot and remember that, that's a really good single word quotation for Jonathan Small's attitude towards the treasure. He sees it as loot, which has connotations around it being ill-gotten or theft or piracy. And when we get on to thinking about know where the treasure has come from i think referring to it as loot uh, could apply to what where it came from before jonathan small stole it so then we see some honor he talks about it that no living man has any right to it unless it is the three men who are in the andaman convict barracks and myself he's talking about the sign of four and it shows that he believes that the sign of four are the ones that have a right to it and this, I've acted all through for them as much as for myself. So this again, this is him being honourable. This is him showing that with all of the actions around the treasure, he's always intended to take it back to the Andamans and split it with the other people that stole it. Quite unlike what um, what Major Sholto was planning on doing, you know, he stole it with Captain Morstan, as we will find out. He stole it with Captain Morstan and then would not share it with Captain Morstan. So in this way, we get more of a parallel between Jonathan Small and Captain Morstan. Uh, I'm sorry, not Captain Morstan, uh, Major Sholto. However, uh, and this is a point of contention that will come up throughout this chapter. This represents an Englishman in the service of in inverted commas, the enemy. This shows that Jonathan Small has more allegiance to three indigenous Indian people than he does to white British people. Now this a little bit talks about Victorian fear. We've talked about this before. The Victorians were scared of people in the colonies rising up and overthrowing them. And now Jonathan Small is working for the very people that would rise up and overthrow the English colonialists. So, so you have to think about this for a Victorian audience. We'll talk a little bit about treason. So moving on. He talks about how he'd rather throw the treasure into the Thames than let it go to Kith or Kin of Shelter or Morstan. This is his revenge. Ultimately, he is more concerned with revenge over Shelto and Morstan than he is of actually having the treasure and being able to use it. We then see some of his affection, you know, the the adjective little here, and where little Tonga is. I think that talks about some affection. It could be talking about, you know, literally Tonga was very small, but we see that Jonathan Small did have quite a lot of feelings towards Tonga. Uh, and then he ends his speech with the repetition, I put the loot away in a safe place. So he, he's using that same imagery of the, that he was in charge, he was the one to make that decision, and he's put it somewhere where no one else can know where it is. Uh, and, and developing the idea that it might link with being a toy, this shows that Jonathan Small feels in a position of power, that he is in control, and he's put it away from where Holmes or Athelny Jones could ever find it. Like, they are the children. Um, so, so, yeah, so there's some, some arrogance in there, too. Now, Athelny Jones still doesn't understand. He's, he's showing here again a lack of detection, a, a lack of detective skills. You know, he says it would have been easier for you to have thrown the box and all. So Jones thinks that Small should have just thrown the whole box. But, you know, Jonathan Small says, easier for me to throw and easier for you to recover, showing that he is smart, or at least he is smarter than Athelny Jones. Uh, we then get the idea that he regretted it, as you would, you know, it was a fortune that he threw over the side of a ship into the Thames. It went to my heart to do it, you know. Uh, and then we see Jonathan Small presented as a stoic figure. Now, I'll go through this and then we'll talk about that. So there's no good grieving over it. I've had ups in my life and I've had downs. But I've learned not to cry over spilled milk, which is an idiom that means not to be worried about things that have already happened. You know, if you've broken something, there's no point crying about it. You can't fix it. This is a stoic attitude. 
Now, Stoicism was a key value in Victorian people. It was the idea that you just accept your lot in life and you just get on with it. And in that way, Jonathan Small represents Victorian values quite strongly. He is very stoic. All right, so I'm going to start at the bottom here. So, justice, snarled the ex-convict. A petty, a pretty justice. Whose loot is this if it is not ours? Where is the justice that I should give it up to those who have never earned it? Look how I have earned it. Twenty long years in that fever-ridden swamp, all day at work under the mangrove tree, all night chained up in the filthy convict huts, bitten by mosquitoes, racked with ague, bullied by every cursed black-faced policeman who loved to take it out of a white man. That was how I earned the Agua Treasure, and you talk to me of justice because I cannot bear to feel that I have paid this price only that another may enjoy it. I would rather swing a score of times or have one of Tonga's darts in my hide than live in a convict cell and feel that another man is at his ease in a palace with the money that should be mine. Smuller dropped his mask of stoicism. And all this came out in a wild whirl of words while his eyes blazed and the handcuffs clanked together with the impassioned movement of his hands. I could understand, as I saw the fury and the passion of the man, that it was no groundless or unnatural terror which had possessed Major Sholto when he first learned that the injured convict was upon his track. You forget that we know nothing of all this, said Holmes quietly. We have not heard your story and we cannot tell how far justice may originally have been on your side. Well, sir... You have been very... Uh, sorry. Well, sir, you have been very fair spoken to me, though I can see that I have you to thank that I have these bracelets upon my wrists. Still, I bear no grudge for that. It is all fair and above board. If you want to hear my story, I have no wish to hold it back. What I say to you is God's truth, every word of it. Thank you. You can put the glass beside me here, and I'll put my lips to it if I am dry. So this is this is a key quotation now. So justice, snarled the ex-convict, a pretty justice. Uh, and and before we talk about you know deep stuff, we've got animal imagery here uh, through the the verb snarled. He's snarling like an animal, linking with all of the violence and and the the terror surrounding Jonathan Small. But but this reference to the word justice now. We talked about the same thing with Mary Morstan. What kind of justice is Jonathan Small talking about? Is he talking about financial justice? Or is he talking about social justice? Uh, is he talking about the justice system that put him in a convict barracks in the first place? It could be all three. You know, in terms of financial justice, he should have that money, he feels. So he should be more secure and not have lived a life of poverty that he has. If we're talking about social justice, well, all Jonathan Small wants to do is improve his lot in life. And even before he stole the treasure, that was what he tried to do. But society and the way that society collapsed in India at the time meant that he didn't receive any of that social justice. Uh, finally, you know, his treatment within the justice system, um, as he says, you know, being bullied by other people, being being left in, a, in an absolute hellhole of a place, not really proportional, he feels, to the crimes that he's committed. We then see this, and, and please remember these three quotations. You know, remember Sherlock Holmes, a pretty business. Athelna Jo... Uh, ah, I keep getting them wrong. <laughs> remember Sherlock Holmes, a pretty demonstration. Uh, Athelna Jones, a pretty business. And now here we have Jonathan Small, a pretty justice. He's, he's imitating Holmes... And the Thelney Jones to some extent. Holmes uses it, a pretty demonstration, to show that his passion and obsession is crime and solving crimes. A Thelney Jones, a pretty a pretty business, shows that his obsession is money, financial gain, um, status. And then Jonathan Small, a pretty justice, to show that Jonathan Small's obsession is justice. And within that, revenge. Let's continue. Okay. So, so then we have a further reference to loot. Um, I'll cover all of these things at the top. Uh, we, we talked about that just a second ago. So financial, social, criminal justice. Um, 
so he uses the term earned as if he had paid his dues to get his revenge and, and certainly you know his description of the places that he's been living would indicate that he has potentially earned it and has had quite a quite a hard life the the mangrove tree uh, working all day under the mangrove tree chained up in filthy huts bitten racked bullied think about the the repetition of verbs there they're all quite negative they're all quite violent that maybe jonathan small feels that he's been treated in a violent way by his environment and the other people there the idea that jonathan small lived his life like a slave that is ironic at a time, I mean, slavery was not as prevalent as maybe at the beginning of the 1800s, but but definitely there was kind of enforced slavery and forced work, and particularly in the colonies, things like that. So the idea that a white person would be living in the conditions of a slave is ironic. Uh, and also maybe shows why Jonathan Small sympathises more with Tonga and why Jonathan Small is more honourable towards the other members of the Sino Four, because he's actually experienced what it's like to be um, treated unfairly. And, and we see that here. He says, he says, bullied by every cursed black-faced policeman. So this shows that the roles have been reversed. And I think this is Conan Doyle making a, a bigger comment on racism. I think this shows that Conan Doyle feels that regardless of whether you're black or white, if the boot is on the other foot, you know, if you've got a, a group of indigenous people that are being put in charge of a white person, they will treat them with racial prejudice. Which, you know, may be true in terms of this time, in terms of the Victorian time, uh, but I think it's mostly true because those people would have experienced hardship and racism from white people from the outset. So it's kind of like a kind of poetic justice that Jonathan Small experiences this. Then he uses the term earned again, you know, thinking about the connotations around revenge being like a job for him. Um, and then he says, I cannot bear to feel that I have paid this price only that, uh, that another may enjoy it. This shows that he has sacrificed freedom and rights as a white man for this treasure. That by hooking up with Tonga, he was unable to to run away from the prison and just resume life back in England, or resume life back in India, that by signing away his rights as a member of the British Army, by falling into league with the other members of the Sign of Four, he's turned his back on something to try and gain something else. You know, like I say, he's sacrificing his freedom and rights as a white man to be able to get this treasure. Uh, swinging again, this is about executions, we talked about that. And this is a really nice metaphor that he would rather live in a convict cell, uh, he'd rather die than live in a convict cell and feel that another man is at his ease in a palace with the money that should be mine. And this is, this metaphor talks about, you know, um, Major Sholto. He'd rather be in prison than think that Major Sholto or someone related to Major Sholto was living a life of luxury while he was in prison. Uh, so now we have this this other mo this is a, a motif that is used a couple of times to describe Jonathan Small. His eyes blazing. Um, maybe again, referencing Sherlock Holmes's eyes, showing some parallel between those two characters. Jonathan Small is talking about something here that he feels very passionate about, and that he spent a lot of his life thinking about. So it could indicate that he's getting uh, very strong feelings about what he's talking about. We then have this piece of onomatopoeia, the handcuffs clanked together, linking with the idea of prison and incarceration. Uh, and he has an impassioned movement. You know, he's, he's moving passionately. So then we see that Watson is a bit scared by Jonathan Small. He believes that it was no groundless or unnatural terror which possessed Major Sholto. He sees that you know, Jonathan Small is capable of being quite scary. However, Sherlock Holmes approaches this in a really, really calm manner. And I think this shows another difference between Holmes and Watson. When presented with Jonathan Small, Watson is scared, but Holmes is able to overlook all of that and 
try and treat him fairly so that he'll get the full story out of him. And we see that when he says this. We cannot tell how far justice may originally have been on your side. So we're referring to this word justice. And maybe this is Holmes picking up on the importance of that word to Jonathan Small. Or maybe it's Holmes understanding that he's not going to get anywhere with Jonathan Small unless Jonathan Small feels that he will receive some sort of justice. Or it may be Holmes is just interested in justice being served. He doesn't care what's really gone on as long as the right people are arrested for the right things. It could also be, you, be, be Sherlock Holmes manipulating Jonathan Small, recognising that word's important and then putting it into his own language to get Jonathan Small to speak. But whatever is going on here, Sherlock Holmes wants to hear Jonathan Small's story. We then see Jonathan Small return to this stoicism. Um, he uses some irony here when he says, I have these bracelets upon my wrists. Particularly humorous irony, because he's talking about jewellery that he no longer has. And he says to Holmes, I bear no grudge. He understands that he's bested. He's behaving humbly. He is behaving in a sportsmanly way. So Jonathan Small wants more representing the Victorian values of stoicism and not getting angry or petulant or cross or anything like that. Uh, now, we talked about Watson as an unreliable narrator because at this point we're about to get Jonathan Small's narrative. So Jonathan Small is going to take over the narration of the story and we're going to have everything said from his mouth. We also have to consider Jonathan Small as an unreliable narrator. And although I think that we really should take everything that he says at face value, you know, we should believe everything that he says, there is potentially an argument for none of this being true. You know, there, there are no people to back up Jonathan Small's story. Sholto and Morstan are both dead. The other people from the Sign of Four are locked up in a convict barracks. Jonathan Small is saying what happened with no no one to verify. And when he says, what I say to you is God's truth, every word of it, we need to think a little bit. Does this make Jonathan Small more or less of an unreliable narrator? You know, is his reassurance satisfying or is his reassurance suspect? Does it make us think, why would you say that if you're going to tell us the truth? Okay. We, we then get Jonathan Small's life story a little bit. So I'm a Worcestershire man myself, born near Pershaw. I dare say you would find a heap of smalls living there now if you were to look. I've often thought of taking a look round there, but the truth is that I was never much of a credit to the family, and I doubt if they would be so very glad to see me. They were all steady chapel-going folk, small farmers, well known and respected over the countryside, while I was always a bit of a rover. At last, however, when I was about 18, I gave them no more trouble, for I got into a mess over a girl and could only get out of it again by taking the Queen's shilling and joining the third buffs, which was just starting for India. I wasn't destined to do much soldiering, however. I had just got past the goose step and learned to handle my musket when I was fool enough to go swimming in the Ganges. Luckily for me, my company sergeant, John Holder, was in the water at the same time, and he was one of the finest swimmers in the service. A crocodile took me. Just as I was halfway across, it nipped off my right leg, as clean as a surgeon could have done it, just above the knee. What with the shock and the loss of blood, I fainted and should have drowned if Holder had not caught hold of me and paddled for the bank. I was five months in hospital over it, and when at last I was able to limp out of it with this timber toe strapped to my stump, I found myself invalided, out of the army, and unfitted for any active occupation. I was, as you can imagine, pretty down on my luck at this time, for I was as a youth for I was a useless cripple, though not yet in my twentieth year. However, my misfortune soon proved to be a blessing in disguise. A man named Abel White, who had come out here as an indigo planter, wanted an overseer to look after his coolies and keep them up to their work. Right, so, so then we find out that, that Jonathan Small uh, came from a fairly rural place in England. Um, this... The, the fact that he says that if you go there, you'd find a heap of smalls. This is another comment on working class people, that they have large families, that they breed a lot, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and then we find out that Jonathan, Jonathan Small was a bit of a black sheep of the family. He says, I was never much of a credit to the family. So he behaved in a way that they didn't really appreciate. 
Now, just to note, so if Jonathan Small was the black sheep of the family, as in he didn't fit, we've got to think a little bit about a little bit about how else this story deals with black sheep of families. And as far as I can see, there are two other references. You know, Dr. Watson's brother, right at the beginning of the novel, you know, the guy who owned the pocket watch, he was very much the black sheep of the family. He did a lot of drinking, a lot of gambling. He pawned away the, the pocket watch over and over again. I believe that that foreshadows Jonathan Small. We also have Thaddeus Sholto, is the black sheep of the family. Whereas Major Sholto and Bartholomew Sholto are concerned with money and ugliness, Thaddeus Sholto is concerned with beauty and aestheticism, and he wants to share the money. So I think there are parallels to be made, and I think definitely in class we will talk about this more as a motif within the novel, but, but the black sheep of the family seems to be something that rears up over and over again. And I guess that with the comparison between Jonathan Small and Thaddeus Sholto, it's in the background, isn't it? How they were raised, the money that they had access to. Maybe Thaddeus Sholto is an example of what Jonathan Small could have become if he'd actually been able to get away with the treasure. Because bear in mind, Thaddeus Sholto was very young when Major Sholto came back from India with the treasure. So, yeah, I think there could be some comparison there. So this, he says, I was always a bit of a rover. This shows that he was a criminal. Uh, and finally, after getting into a bit of bother, he takes the Queen's shilling, which is an idiom for joining the army. If any of you have watched Peaky Blinders uh, or know anything about World War I, you know that joining the army in World War I was taking the King's shilling. Well, the monarch at this time is Queen Victoria, so taking the Queen's shilling, it means joining the army. And also, you know, there, there is a little bit of, of structural symmetry there in that Sherlock Holmes gives um, Mordecai Smith's son a shilling. He also pays the Baker Street Irregulars with a shilling. So I think there is some, some connotations there. Uh, Jonathan Small, we find out, didn't do much uh, soldiering. He was very inexperienced. And here we see Jonathan Small's first piece of bad luck. Swimming across the Ganges, he gets his leg bitten off by a crocodile. Which is very, very unlucky. He can't have planned for that. There wasn't anything that Jonathan Small did really wrong. It was out of his control. And we will see as the story progresses that Jonathan Small has to deal with situations that are out of his control. And he gets into this situation because of bad luck. So, but he's very typically Victorian in the way that he describes it. He says, a crocodile took me. I nipped off my right leg. This is an understatement. It is a euphemism. He, it would have been a very traumatic experience having your leg bitten off by a crocodile. So he's showing that he embodies this Victorian attitude of to not complain too much, to keep your feelings to yourself a little bit, much in the same way that Mary Morstan does. Uh, he also uses this metaphor, timber toe, that's a wooden leg. Uh, and we get some attitude towards disability, and this would have been the attitude just generally across Victorian society. Anybody with one leg was a useless cripple. So, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. However, he does manage to find one job overse as, as overseer of some coolies, which was kind of like the term for forced workers on plantations in India. And that job was to monitor, beat and threaten this man able white slaves. So we have to recognise that at this point in the story, Jonathan Small represents colonialism. He's gone to India as a soldier to do the empire's work. He's going to have been over there. Well, he didn't do much of soldiering, but if he had remained as a soldier, he would have done all of the things that the British soldiers did to the Indian populations, you know, the massacres, the famines, the, the mistreatment, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and also, from that, he becomes an overseer at a plantation, treating the workforce badly, uh, imposing the will of white British people on indigenous Indian people. So definitely at this point in the story, Jonathan Small represents colonialism. He is, a, he is a, a, an avatar for white working class people that went over to India 
and reinforced colonial values. So he happened to be a friend of our colonels, who had taken an interest in me since the accident. To make a long story short, the colonel recommended me strongly for the post, and as the work was mostly to be done on horseback, my leg was no great obstacle, for I had enough knee left to keep good grip on the saddle. What I had to do was to ride over the plantation to keep an eye on the men as they worked, and to report idlers. The pay was fair, I had comfortable quarters, and altogether I was content to spend the remainder of my life in indigo planting. Mr. Aberwhite was a kind man, and would often drop into my little shanty and smoke a pipe with me, for white folk out there feel their hearts warm to each other as they never do here at home. Well, I was never in luck's way long. Suddenly, without a note of warning, the great mutiny broke out upon us. One month India lay as still and peaceful to all appearance as Surrey or Kent. The next, there were 200,000 black devils let loose and the country was a perfect hell. Of course, you know all about it, gentlemen. A deal more than I do, very like, since reading is not my line. I only know what I saw with my own eyes. Our plantation was at a place called Mutra, near the border of the northwest provinces. Night after night, the whole sky was alight with the burning bungalows, and day after day we had small companies of Europeans passing through our estate with their wives and children, on their way to Agra. Where were the nearest troops? Mr. Abelwhite was an obstinate man. He had it in his head that the affair had been exaggerated, as it would blow over as suddenly as it had sprung up. There he sat on his veranda, drinking whiskey pegs and smoking cheroots, while the country was in a blaze about him. Of course we stuck by him, I and Dawson, who with his wife used to do the bookwork and the managing. Right, so, um, I'll cover the, the thing about the Indian mutiny when we get there. But but let's let's just cover some of this, this language. So, the colonel, that is a, a reference to empire, but also a reference to patriarchy. The fact that the colonel that was friends with Jonathan Small was able to secure him a job shows, you know, patriarchy control. Um that Jonathan Small had to report idlers. That's, that's another Victorian value. Anyone idling was seen as wrong. You know, and bear in mind those idlers, they were essentially slaves, probably not treated very well. They were probably very, very tired. Uh, this, we have more links with Victorian colonial fear. He says that white folk out there feel their hearts warm to each other as they never do here at home. This is because the white people out there were scared of the indigenous people around them. They had absolute control over them, and I'm sure they, well, I know, they ruled by fear. But at the same time, this Indian mutiny that we're going to go into in a minute was one of the biggest fears for Victorian society, particularly Victorian people, uh, white Victorian people living in the colonies. So then we get, suddenly, without a note of warning... The Great Mutiny broke upon us. So he's talking here about the Indian Mutiny. And this was a real event that happened uh, in India. And, and I just want to really quickly go into some of the details of it. So the Indian Mutiny, this happened because Indian soldiers working for England were forced to use ammunition and weapons stored in beef fat. Now this was an issue because of their religion uh, and their values they didn't want to handle things that had beef fat on it. However, Britain would not back down, so the soldiers mutinied. And this was just one thing in a long, long, long line of uh, issues that the indigenous people who were fighting for the British uh, and were cooperating with the British were experiencing. Uh, it, it was kind of the breaking point of their tolerance. And so great swathes of the Indian population, particularly those that had been trained as soldiers, rose up and started killing uh, white British people. So just within this, uh, and this happened in 1857, so just to note where that fits in with the context of the story, this is some 25, 30 years before this story is actually written. But, but just for context, within this, the, the Indian soldiers killed 6,000 European people. However, once the British army had got back into India and had taken control, they murdered 800,000 Indian people in retaliation. So I think this shows the scale of the issue within India. And I'm not saying that the, the Indian people were right to murder 6,000 Europeans. However, the retaliation, I don't think, was very proportional to the crime that had been acted. OK. 
Okay, so just going back, just remembering that all that information about the Indian Mutiny as we move forward. So he say here he says here that that India lay is still and peaceful. So this is the British India. This is the India formed in the uh, in the model of Britain. Appeared to all, sorry, to all appearance was as peaceful as Surrey or Kent. This is a very Eurocentric view that Jonathan Small would class the height of peace as countries, uh, sorry, as, as, as places within England shows that, you know, he believes that England is the best and that everything in the world should be like England. We then get some religious imagery, some negative religious imagery to describe the people mutinying. He describes them as black devils. He describes the country as a perfect hell. You know, this is all imagery that we've seen applied to Tonga as well. And it, it shows the, the British mentality towards um, indigenous people within these countries. And particularly you know, indigenous people that are fighting back. Uh, we then get something to do with Jonathan Small and class. Uh, he says here, since reading is not my line, so this says that he, he can't read or at least he struggles with reading. This again shows that he has poor education and that he's lower class. This also is confirmation of Sherlock Holmes and his detective skills, because if you remember back to Sherlock Holmes describing Jonathan Small to Athelney Jones, the first thing he says is, this will be a man of lower education. And Jonathan Small is confirming that, which again shows Sherlock Holmes as being a really good detective. So then we have some description of the actual mutiny. So he says the whole sky was alight with the burning bungalows. Uh, it's like a war, or, or even that this is like hell. Um, this shows that uh, we, we then get the description of the wives and children coming through. That these are weak and vulnerable groups. Again, this is a very Victorian thing. If you think back to, to something like the Titanic... This is the image of men standing to guard their properties and fight while women and children run. This talks about honour within the patriarchal society. This talks about men being the protectors of the women. Uh, but, but also the image of women and children having to walk through this rebellion adds to the horror of the, the image. Uh, it makes it seem even more brutal. Now, Mr. Abelwhite, quite optimistic that everything is going to be fine. He sits drinking whiskey pegs, smoking cheroots. This juxtaposes the the image that Jonathan Small creates. Uh, this idea that a man is sitting there smoking and drinking while everything around him burns. Um, but but also it shows you know that people within the upper class didn't necessarily take things seriously, or at least had the confidence that other people within their class would mobilize and protect them you know um, yeah and, and just just developing this idea of Eurocentric view I know we've talked about it before but it's the idea that anything different or anything that doesn't benefit Western Europe is bad or wrong or evil you know uh, definitely Jonathan Small and Holmes and Mr. Abelwhite in this instance have quite a Eurocentric view so. Well, one fine day the crash came. I had been away on a distant plantation and was riding slowly home in the evening when my eye fell upon something all huddled together at the bottom of a steep nuller. I rode down to see what it was, and the cold struck through my heart when I found it was Dawson's wife, all cut into ribbons and half eaten by jackals and native dogs. A little further at the road, Dawson himself was lying on his face, quite dead, with an empty revolver in his hand and four sepoys lying across each other in front of him. I reined up my horse, wondering which way I should turn, but at that moment I saw thick smoke curling up at Abel White's bungalow and the flames beginning to burst through the roof. I knew then that I could do my employer no good, but would only throw my own life away if I meddled in the matter. From where I stood, I could see hundreds of the black fiends with their red coats still on their backs, dancing and howling round the burning house. Some of them pointed at me, and a couple of bullets sang past my head. So I broke away across the paddy fields and found myself late at night safe within the walls of Agra. As it proved, however, there was no great safety there either. The whole country was up like a swarm of bees, 
Wherever the English could collect in little bands, they held just the ground that their guns commanded. Everywhere else they were helpless fugitives. It was a fight of the millions against the hundreds, and the cruelest part of it was that these men that we fought against, foot, horse and gunners, were our own picked troops, whom we had taught and trained, handling our own weapons and blowing our own bugle calls. At Agra, there were the third Bengal Fusiliers, some Sikhs, two troops, a horse, and a battery of artillery. Okay, let's just leave through this then. So, um, so, so, Jonathan Small, his look, obviously, you know, thinking about the previous page, he's been very unlucky that the Indian Mutiny happened. However, the one good piece of luck that he has is that he survives the Indian Mutiny and manages to get to the Agra Four. I want you to think, as we get through this, and as we find out more of the things that have happened to Jonathan Small, might it have been better if he hadn't survived? Might it have been better if he had died? I want you to have that thought in your head as we're going through. So to clarify, a nullah, that means a riverbed. Um, this, as he sees what has happened, the cold struck through my heart. Remember that quotation. This is Jonathan Small reacting to seeing uh, a woman butchered. This shows empathy and sadness and feeling within Jonathan Small. This really develops his character by showing that he has some tender emotions within him. Now, the way that he describes the scene, talking about her being cut into ribbons and half eaten by jackals and native dogs. This is Indian violence he is describing. And all of this links further to Victorian fear and Victorian fear of the colonies, you know, that we've been talking about all along. Now here we have the image of the husband Dawson, dead, with an empty revolver in his hand and four sepoys lying across each other in front of him. Although this is a violent death, it's a violent death that shows that he fought to his own death. It is a heroic death for Dawson. Uh, now we see some dishonour with Jonathan Small. We've talked about him being an honourable person, but there is some dishonour in this. Uh, he sees that if he were to try and protect Abel White, he would only throw my own life away if I meddled in the matter. This shows a high degree of self-protection for Jonathan Small, and a, a degree of self-protection that we will see used again and again throughout his story. It, it is dishonourable for a soldier as well and in terms of victorian values if you were to think about a poem that the poem the charge of the light brigade that we will look at within the anthology that poem talks about soldiers throwing their lives away to obey an order now jonathan small protecting abel white that would have been an order you know the the idea that the lower classes would protect the middle and the upper middle classes particularly in the colonies was just a given so jonathan small here is disobeying an order or disobeying an obligation, I should say, uh, and showing that you know he does have some dishonourable qualities within him. Now, this the 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 black fiends. This is another comment on race. This further develops the idea that you know they are animalistic. Uh, but then we also get this contrasting image that they are wearing red coats. So this is the army uniform, the British army u uniform at the time, showing that these were men that had betrayed, in Jonathan Small's eyes, betrayed the, the British Empire. Uh, we think it's some more animal imagery in their dancing and howling around the burning house. And I think potentially here this is Jonathan Small embellishing to try to communicate uh, and, and touch on Victorian theory even more. Uh, we then get some more references to violence, the bullets sang past my head, all that kind of stuff. So so now we get his kind of description of the Indian mutiny away from his experience with Abel White. He talks about the whole country was up like a swarm of bees. This, this simile, using an English idea, uh, it is a violent thing. Uh, it talks about how the Indian soldiers were potentially quite single-minded. You know, they acted like a hive of bees. They acted in one. Um, but also, it talks about there is no concern for their own safety, and there is no concern for the safety of the people that they are attacking, in the same way that 
if you were to disturb a hive of bees, they would all just come out and attack you. Now, to, to, to clarify this, this as an English idea, and I think, again, we need to think about why do people use similes? What is the point of using a simile? Well, a simile is used to describe something to someone that they don't know what it is like. Now, a Victorian audience generally at this time would have lived in England. They wouldn't have actually known what the Indian mutiny was like. They wouldn't have seen it for themselves. So Jonathan Small, by comparing them to a swarm of bees, people in England would know what a swarm of bees was like. And they would be able to connect the panic at seeing a swarm of bees to, to, to Jonathan Small seeing these massive groups of, of guys within this rebellion. So I think that really he uses that simile to better communicate with the Victorian audience uh, and, and show them what it was like to be in that place at that time. Jonathan Small then talks about how difficult it was to hold off the rebellion. He says that wherever the English were collecting little bands, they held just the ground that their guns commanded, that they could literally just hold off any area that they could shoot from. Um, here we now see a really nice reversal of colonialist positions. He says that it was a fight of millions against the hundreds, in which the British were the hundreds and the Indians were the millions. Well, I think this must have been how indigenous populations felt when colonialist British people arrived and started to take over their countries. It was a fight of the small against the large. They may have still had the numbers, but the British had far superior weaponry uh, and, and all of that kind of stuff. So it's definitely a reversal of colonial positions. Um, and Jonathan Small sees the actions of the Indian army as a betrayal and as treason. He talks about how they were their own picked troops and that they were handling our own weapons, blowing our own bugle calls. Uh, the, the idea that he feels that the Indian people in the army kind of owed the British something and shouldn't have behaved in this way. Okay. So, a volunteer corps of clerks and merchants have been formed and this I joined Wooden Leg and All. We went out to meet the rebels at Shangung earlier in July and we beat them back for a time but our powder gave out and we had to fall back upon the city. Nothing but the worst news came to us from every side, which is not to be wondered at, for if you look at the map, you will see that we were right in the heart of it. Look now is rather better than a hundred miles to the east, and Cornpaw about as far to the south. From every point on the compass, there was nothing but torture and murder and outrage. The city of Agra is a great place, swarming with fanatics and fierce devil worshippers of all sorts. Our handful of men were lost among the narrow, winding streets. Our leader moved across the river, therefore, and took up his position in the old fort at Agra. I don't know if any of you gentlemen have ever read or heard anything of that old fort. It is a very queer place, the queerest that ever I was in, and I've been in some rum corners too. First of all, it, was an, it is enormous in size. I should think that the enclosure must be acres and acres. There is a modern park which took all our garrison, women, children, stores and everything else, with plenty of room over. But the modern park is nothing like the size of the old quarter, where nobody goes, and which is given over to the scorpions and the centipedes. It is all full of great deserted halls and winding passages, and long corridors twisting in and out, so that it is easy enough for folk to get lost in. For this reason, it was seldom that anyone went into it, though now and again a party with torches might go exploring. The river washes along the front of the old fort and so protects it, but on the sides and behind there are many doors, and these had to be guarded, of course, in the old quarter, as well as in that which was actually held by our troops. Okay, so just not much on this, but let, let's just cover these few points. So there is honour here, he's showing himself to be honourable again, that he is fighting to protect people. You know, we went out to meet the rebels, he was part of that force. However, they ran out of gunpowder, our powder gave out. So they had to retreat. So, yeah, they were unable to subdue the, the Indian forces. Now, this is a, is, a, is a great quotation, and it foreshadows a, a quotation later in this chapter. From every point on the compass, there was nothing but torture and murder and outrage. 
Uh, this metaphor in this rule of three shows that Jonathan Small was surrounded by violence. That at this point, the, the English people were outnumbered, backed into a corner. It was a really, really hopeless situation. And again, I keep banging on about it, but this all relates to Victorian fear, particularly Victorian colonial fear. Uh, he talks here again that the, great Ag the, the city of Agra is a great place swarming with fanatics and fierce devil worshippers. This word swarming here talks about insects, vermin. Remember Tonga swarming up the rope. Uh, sorry, Jonathan Small swarming up the rope. That idea that it was like a beehive talks about the idea of swarms. And, and it all has connotations of mindless, working as a unit, having no care for yourself or those around you. And this Victorian fear is further developed when he talks about how the city was full of fanatics and fierce devil worshippers. And that again has a really Eurocentric view to it because I doubt that there were any people in India at that time worshipping Satan, the Christian Satan. He is conflating the religions of Hinduism and Islam and, uh, and Sikhism with devil worshipping. He's saying you don't worship the Christian God, you don't worship Jesus, therefore whoever you are worshipping, it must be the devil. Uh, and that's what I'm getting at when I say a Eurocentric view. If it isn't Western European, it is evil and it is wrong. And, and that is Victorian attitude towards the colonies and that is Victorian fear, or, or at least one part of Victorian fear. Uh, rum corners is a euphemism for bad places that Jonathan Small has been in some bad places and none of them were as bad as the Fort at Agra. They get a little bit of a description of the fort. We see it as being massive and scary with the scorpions and centipedes within it. Uh, there is a certain amount of danger within it. But I believe that, that Conan Doyle here is mirroring Pondicherry Lodge. He's injecting some of those gothic horror tropes when he talks about long corridors, winding passages, deserted halls. These are all things that you would typically find in a Victorian haunted house. Maybe connecting with some of Jonathan Small's more supernatural views regarding the treasure. Okay. So we were short-handed, with hardly men enough to man the angles of the building and to serve the guns. It was impossible for us, therefore, to station a strong guard at every one of the innumerable gates. What we did was to organise a central guardhouse in the middle of the fort and to leave each gate under the charge of one white man and two or three natives. I was selected to take charge during certain hours of the night of a small isolated door upon the southwest side of the building. Two Sikh troopers were placed under my command and I was instructed, if anything went wrong, to fire my musket when I might rely upon help coming at once from the central guard. As the guard was a good 200 paces away, however, and as the space between was cut up in a labyrinth of passages and corridors, I had great doubts as to whether they could arrive in time to be of any use in case of an actual attack. Well, I was pretty proud at having this small command given me, since I was a raw recruit and a game-legged one at that. For two nights, I kept the watch with my Punjabis. They were tall, fierce-looking chaps, Malmit Singh and Abdullah Khan by name, both old fighting men who had borne arms against us at Chile and Walla. They could talk English pretty well, but I could get little out of them. They preferred to stand together and jabber all night in their queer Sikh lingo. For myself, I used to stand outside the gateway, looking down on the broad, winding river and on the twinkling lights of the great city. The beating drums, the rattle of tom-toms, and the yells and howls of the rebels, drunk with opium and with bang, were enough to remind us all night of our dangerous neighbours across the stream. Every two hours, the officer of the night used to come round to all the posts to make sure that all was well. Okay. So, so, yeah. Just make sure you put at the top of your page something about this Victorian fear that I have been banging on about a lot. The idea of Victorians were scared of indigenous people from the colonies rising up and killing them. And particularly Conan Doyle develops this on this page. So they are outgunned. The force was weak and could not really protect itself. It couldn't guard every single door. It couldn't prepare for every single eventuality. 
and so they had to work on kind of a reduced force. Now this is uh, more colonialist ideas here. The fact that they had one white man and two or three natives. The idea that the white man is superior to the natives. The idea that the white man does not trust the natives. You know, bear in mind, these are the, the native people that have come with them are people running away from the rebellion as well. So the idea that they couldn't be trusted to guard the fort is a bit of a strange one. Now we get our reference to uh, Abdullah Khan and Mahomet Singh, the two Sikh troopers placed under Jonathan's command. Um, now this kind of links him with colonialist ideas. The fact that Jonathan Small with his one leg is seen as more competent than two, what we find out as tall, fierce looking Sikh men who are both really competent fighters the fact that Jonathan Small is seen as more competent than them by being put in charge is, again, colonialist, Eurocentric view. Um, yeah. Now, Jonathan Small, there is some doubt here that is injected. And this might be a narrative device on his part to try and make him seem more sympathetic. It could be true. We don't know. This is one of those unreliable narrator moments. But Jonathan Small establishes this doubt as a reason for his actions next. Now, it shows that he doesn't feel that he was safe if something bad were to happen. Because something bad is about to happen. So we've seen already that Jonathan Small is prepared to protect his own life. And I believe Jonathan Small injects this to show that what he did next was in an effort to protect his own life. We then have some some description of Mahomet Singh and Abdullah Khan. They're described as being tall, fierce-looking, uh, both being old fighting men. Uh, the idea that they had once fought against the British Army, you know, they, they weren't always on the side with the British Army, um, kind of develops their characters as being a little bit aggressive and violent. Also, we have more colonialist thing here, where Jonathan Small uses the word jabber, uh, this is more Eurocentric that because they're not speaking English, their language is of less value. Therefore, the words they're saying are of less value. You get the, the, the picture. You, you understand what I'm talking about. And then finally, finally, we are presented with this bestial, exotic image of the rebels outside the gates of the Agra Fort, beating drums, rattling tom-toms, yelling and howling, which is further animal imagery, um, basically under the influence of opium uh, and bang, which is like a stimulant. Now, opium is the drug that Holmes is using. I think this is a comment, again, on indigenous people versus upper-middle-class British people. Upper-middle-class upper British people can handle their drugs and are fine to use drugs, but when it comes to indigenous people using drugs, it makes them turn into animals. Okay. Great, so, so that is it for section one. In the next section, we see Jonathan Small, Mahomet Singh and Abdullah Khan actually getting their hands on the treasure. Uh, and we see more unlucky things happening to Jonathan Small. I should try and get the video out as quick as possible. Uh, but for now, uh, I'll say bye, guys, uh, and I'll speak to you all soon. Bye-bye.